Well, one lawmaker who feels the climate bill does fall short of what America needs is Maryland Congressman Roscoe Bartlett, and he joins us now for a little bit of insight into uh, this climate bill and all things energy. Congressman, thank you so much for coming by. Happy to be on. Thank you. Now, every Maryland congressman voted for this bill with the exception of one. What, what was your biggest problems with it? Oh, I had a huge number of problems with it. Number one was my constituents who were calling in at least 51 saying no, no, no. They didn't need to do that because I was going to vote against it anyhow. It was just the wrong solution for the problem. It was the wrong premise. You know, I lived through uh, World War II and we had enormous behavioral changes. And most of those were not coerced by legislation. They were, were the result of patriotism and education. And we're just seriously, seriously lacking that today. So you talk about America needing improved efficiency, conservation, and investments uh, in developing a range of alternatives to oil. What, what do you want to see? Well, first of all, I would like to see some education and some emphasis on, on conservation. You know, back at the Arab oil embargo, we had a lot of that. We didn't have email then and so forth, but we had van pools and we had 1-800 numbers and we had a car pooling and we had a decal over the light switch that said, don't be foolish, turn out the light when you leave the room. We had a decal over the thermostat that said, turn it up in the summertime and down in the wintertime. And we knew that was temporary. We knew that by and by the Arabs would sell us oil again. Uh -huh. This is not temporary today. This is not going to go away. Where is the emphasis on conservation? Americans are very patriotic. They really want to do the right thing. Back in World War II, we all had victory guards. There was no legislation that said you had to have a victory guard. We all saved our household grease and carried it to a central repository. Nobody said you had to do that. We did that because we knew it was the right thing to do. There are two other very much better reasons for doing what this bill wants people to do, and that is the national security reason we really shouldn't be this dependent on foreign oil. And, and the other very good reason for doing it is that by and by these fossil fuels just aren't going mm -hmm. to be there. And the American people can understand those two things. They aren't understanding the push they're making now. You know, we just went through the second coldest June in history. And we are in global warming. You know, American people are having a hard time understanding that. Yeah. The bill has the wrong premise. It is unsalvageable. No matter what the Senate does with this bill, I don't think they can salvage it. Okay, so so there there aren't changes that the Senate can make to this bill or or in its own bill, um, other than beefing up conservation uh, measures and efficiency that would have you in favor of it. Well, you know. <laughs> Conservation doesn't need to be legislated. We could immediately reduce CO2 emissions on the road drastically if just two people got in a car. I drive down here to work, two of us in the car. The other day we were in a Prius, two of us in a Prius. Beside us was one person in an SUV. We were getting six times the miles per gallon per person in the Prius. So how Did do you do it if it's not legislated? SUV? Education. Education. That's how we got victory gardens. That's how we saved household grease. That's how we did all of the things that we needed to do during World War II. The American people need to understand why they are patriotic. They want to do the right thing. You know, but they're coerced into this. They're forced into it. You know, and they're just pushing back, really pushing back. I sat beside John Dingo. I said, John, how are your calls going? Oh, he said, overwhelmingly against it. I said, and you're going to vote for it? Yeah, I said, it's a bitter pill. They've got to swallow it. <laughs> right, which is Well, the which American is the people don't right want now. to swallow this bitter pill. And they would not consider it a bitter pill if they knew they were doing it for good patriotic reasons, but they don't understand that. Now, you are in favor of a, of a nice move towards uh, uh, renewables. You were, oh, you, you were green long before it was cool to be green, and you had a, a big moves into solar. What do you see as, um, as the short-term fix, though, until those renewables are up to speed and transmission lines are, are ready? Uh, conservation. We use twice as much energy as the, as the average person in Europe. There are 22 countries in the world that use less energy than we, some significantly less energy than we, whose people feel better about their quality of life than we feel about our quality of life. You don't, we, we use a fourth of all the energy in all the world. We're one out of 22 people. You don't need to use that much energy to feel good. Americans would feel better about their quality of life if they understood why they needed to use less energy. They don't understand that. They're not told that. And to reduce CO2, they're just not buying that. Maryland may get uh, one of the first of a new generation nuclear plants at Calvert Cliffs. What, what's your stance on, on expanding nuclear? Do we need to? Oh, I was a couple of weeks ago. I spent a weekend in, in, in France and I went to Arriva there and France gets 80% of their electricity from nuclear. Yeah, we need to be moving that direction. We've had a, a, an emotional response to nuclear that just isn't rational, a rational aversion to nuclear, and we're coming around. I, I know people, and I can mention one of them, um, 
Mark Udall, who is now in the Senate, and Mark says I can say this publicly, but he was devoutly opposed to nuclear, but when he's considering a probable alternative to nuclear, which is shivering in the dark, <laughs> he is now seeing nuclear much more positively, and I think most Americans are. Okay, a couple of other issues. Uh, some, some in the Maryland different communities are worried about this, uh, this path line in Jefferson City, Potomac, yeah. Appalachian Transmission High Line. Um, do you think that this is needed to bring more power as, as uh, energy demand increases there? Well, again, education is the important thing here. We had a gas line go through, and we, I talked to our people, and they, you know, if the gas line has to go through, the gas line has to go through. Uh, some say it doesn't pump. need to be upgraded, that you can use well, existing you know, infrastructure. That's a matter of, of education. Again, American, they need to understand whether this has to happen or not. If, in fact, we have to have this line, and people are educable, they will believe this if it's believable. So if you're we educated, have to have the line, they, then you put it in the least offensive place. And I would let the local people decide. But within these boundaries, the line has to go. You now tell us where you would like that line in your community. It's got to go there. For the, for, for the national security of our country, we've got to have this line. If that's true, they need to make that point. And then let the local people decide where, no matter what line the feds, no matter what route the feds uh, suggest, it's going to be the wrong place to put it. Right. Well, talking about you know, high voltage transmission, interstate transmission, um, you know, there was a story in the New York Times earlier this week about this regional divide between East Coast and other parts yeah. of the country, and there's a coalition of East Coast governors you know, trying to block a mandate for um, against interstate transmission. Do you think we need national interstate high voltage transmission? Oh, uh, absolutely. You know, we, we can't have, it'd be nice if we could localized power production, but you just can't do that. We've got to be moving power uh, uh, back and forth across across state lines. Of, uh, of course we have to. Um, okay, so so what do you say needs to be the solution other than efficiency? Um, no, and, not, and not efficiency, conservation. Conservation, conservation is, is, is different, you see. Conservation is two people getting in a car. Efficiency is two people getting in a Prius. So we need to go conservation first. Enormous, enormous strides can be made with just conservation. It costs nothing. As a matter of fact, it saves money. But Americans need to understand that they need to do it. If they understood that, they would do it. It's a little inconvenient to carpool with somebody. But you know, I, I, I was in Europe just recently, and I did not see one SUV. They just don't exist. Mm -hmm. I was there during Sarkozy's election. I saw one SUV It was parked behind that church up on a hill. There is no such thing as a pickup truck in Europe for personal transportation. I never saw a pickup truck. I saw work trucks. But they're obviously work trucks. They're not fancy ego-boosting things that we buy in this country. They're obviously work trucks. You know, th this culture can change. And, and we need to change the culture. We did in World War II, we had enormous changes in behavior. As I remember, most of those were not legislated. They were simply the result of education of people knowing what they needed to do. What this bill hopes to accomplish could be accomplished painlessly just with education, the American people understanding what was the right thing to do. And that's what you meant at the Go Green Conference, the Go Energy Conference, when you said every day we had, we had a great, day. We, that's right. We had a great success. I bought the first Prius in Maryland. I bought the first Prius in, in, in Congress. Uh, you know, back in the late 70s and early 80s, I was building solar houses. You know, uh, Americans will buy into this. They understand the real reasons for buying into it. National security and, and fossil fuels just won't be there. The world has now reached its maximum capacity for producing oil. From now on, it's going to be down. By the way, a great speech was given 52 years ago, the 14th day of this May, by Hyman Rickover in St. Well, this Paul, is one Minnesota. Day for an anniversary of speeches. Huh? That's right. Well, it's 52 years ago. And, and just read that speech. Fantastic speech. We were then 100 years into the age of oil. He had no idea how long it would last, but he knew one thing that the age of oil would be but a blip in the 8,000 year recorded history of man. Now we know how long the age of oil will be. It will be, 100, it will be 300 years. We're 150 years into the age of oil. And in 150 years, we'll be through the age of oil. From now on, it's going to be ever less and less, harder and harder to get, more and more expensive. Great speech given by Hyman Rickover. Okay. Very prophetic. We'll take a look at that speech. Good day for that, as well as President Carter's speech. And um, I'm picking you up for work tomorrow. We'll go in together, OK? OK. I, I go in at 5 a.m. Uh, I would enjoy that. All right. Know. I'll <laughs> see you there. Congressman Bartlett, thank you so much. OK, thanks. In other